Hey, hey, LaSalle. This is Lucas. I am your communications director, and I would like to welcome you to our Sunday morning service. Uh, normally, we have a congregation member uh, deliver this greeting and pray us in to our service, but I have hijacked that spot this morning so that I could let you all know about something very important going on today. Right after our service is done at 11.15 a.m., we are going to be hosting our congregational meeting over Zoom. This is an incredibly important time for our church. We're going to be reviewing some ba major ministry updates. We're going to be giving a financial update as well. And also we will be voting to approve the new slate of elder board candidates. So if it's at all possible, I would encourage you to join us again over Zoom for the congregational meeting right after our service is over at 11.15 a.m. You can find the link to that Zoom meeting on our live page at lasallestreetchurch.org slash live. Also on that page, you'll be able to find some bios for our elder board candidates in case you'd like to review that before we vote on it in the meeting, as well as the minutes from our budget meeting earlier this year, which we will be voting to approve as well. I hope you will consider joining us for the congregational meeting. And without further ado, if you could bow your heads and join me in prayer. Lord God, be with us this morning. Be with your people. Fill this service with your presence and heal us, God. God, take the exhausted this morning and give them a moment of respite. Take the injured this morning and heal them, God. And take the complacent, God, and, and fill them with ferve for, for your mission, for your kingdom on earth. Be with our city, God, and be with every last one of us. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, good morning, LaSalle. We uh, may be all in separate places again this morning, but we are worshiping together. So if you are worshiping and following along on our live page, I invite you as we begin to sing to click on the video title, log into the YouTube chat, and let us know that you're singing with us. Uh, let's begin together. There's a world at war, caught in suffering, silent casualties. Oh God, grant us peace. In these sleepless nights, I can hardly breathe. Despite brutality, I know that we'll be free. I know that we'll be free. So let the light in, keep it shining. Let it break into the darkness. All the love dares us to see. We'll all be free. And in these desperate times, love will hold us here. Love will join our hands, teach us to have no fear. So we lay our hate down to wash their feet. When we see our brother, we'll all be free. Yeah, we'll all be free. So let the light in, keep it shining. Let it break into the darkness All love tells us to see We'll all be free So let the light in, keep it shine Let it break into the darkness All love tells us to see We'll all be free And we'll be free We'll all be free. We'll be free. Free. We'll all be 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 free.
will all be free. And we'll be free. Free. We'll all be free. We'll be free. Free. We'll all be free. Yeah, we are free. Let the light in, keep it shining. Let it break into the darkness. All the love dares us to see. We'll all be free. Let the light in, keep it shining. Let it break into the darkness. All the love dares us to see. We'll all be free. Tell your sister, tell your brother, tell your father, tell your mother, tell yourselves, tell everybody, we'll all be free. Tell the lovers, tell the haters, tell the prisoners, tell the jailers, tell the nerd, tell everybody, we'll all be free. So tell your sister, tell your brother. Tell your father, tell your mother, tell yourselves, tell everybody, we'll all be free. Just tell the lovers, tell the haters, tell the prisoners, tell the jailers, tell the world, tell everybody, we'll all be free. Yeah, we'll all be free. Yes, we'll all be free. Yeah, we'll all be free. God, we mean that this morning. We trust that this morning, um, that even as we acknowledge that racism and white supremacy are things that keep us all imprisoned, um, both those of us at the top and at the bottom and everywhere in between, we acknowledge that you are at work setting us free. So help us join with you. Jesus, send your light and your love and your spirit. Come and set us free. Inspire us to walk with you, to stand with you, to work with you, to say to one another, we need you to survive. We need each other. and to support one another, to fight for one another. Help us to do that. Inspire us to do that this morning. Sustain us to do that as we go out into our week. Strengthen us for the journey. Be with us, Jesus, we pray. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Let's break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain. There is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain. 
to break every chain, to break every chain. So break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Oh, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Let the light keep it shining. Let it break into the darkness. All the love dares us to see that we'll all be free. And tell your sister, tell your brother. Tell your father, tell your mother, tell yourself, tell everybody, we'll all be free. Tell the lovers, tell the haters, tell the prisoners, tell the jailers, tell the world, tell everybody, we'll all be free. Yes, we'll all be free. Yes, we'll all be free. Hi, LaSalle. I'm Charlie. I graduated North Central College on May 3rd with a bachelor's degree in psychology with minors in Spanish and leadership studies. In the fall, I'll be continuing my education by pursuing a graduate degree at DePaul University within their clinical mental health counseling program. Hi, my name is Lydia Campbell. I recently graduated from Nutra High School. I'm going to Colorado College in Colorado Springs in the fall, and I'm grateful to God that I was able to graduate high school and have the opportunity to attend a four-year college. My name is Christopher Lewis Carloso. I am a senior at Jones College Prep, and I am going to DePaul University. I'm Eloise Nelson. I graduated from Timothy Christian Middle School. In the fall, I'll be going to Timothy Christian High School. I'm grateful to the LaSalle community for helping me out along the way. I'm Jonah Nelson, and I'm graduating from Timothy Christian High School. I'm going to be attending St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota in the fall, hopefully in person. And I just wanted to say, I've been at LaSalle for all my life, and I really want to thank everyone for all the support they've provided, and I'm going to really miss everyone. Hi, my name is Annika Norby, and I'm graduating from LaSalle Language Academy on uh, Thursday, and then in the fall I'll be attending Lane Tech. Um, and I noticed the goodness of God at my lake house. Congratulations, graduates. We are so proud of you. Oh, LaSalle family, we get an opportunity to pass the love and peace of Christ to those around us. So pick up your phones, um, get your email, pass the peace to someone, and let's also remember these dear graduates with their whole life in front of them. Pass the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ to them too. Peace of Christ be with you.
Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. The word of the Lord. Good morning, LaSalle. Mm, this has been a week of protest, hasn't it? Protests in all 50 states, people in the streets from Chicago to New York to Denver to Birmingham to Dallas, and not just here, it's all around the world. As people marched in the streets in New Zealand and Wales and Australia and Germany and these three women doing it Italian style. Think about that with me for a moment. People all around the world, thousands upon thousands, are leaving their homes and going out in the street to protest a police killing that happened in Minneapolis, Minnesota, a place that many of them couldn't even find on a map. And we're recording this on Friday morning. <laughs> Friday morning, the news and the protests just keep going. Who knows what it'll be 48 hours later when you watch this on Sunday morning. People all around the world in all languages, in all colors, in all ethnicities are standing in solidarity. I hear you. I see you. I see this war on black and brown bodies. I see the systematic abuse. I believe your experiences. A growing chorus. Is this a moment? Pastor Randall asked last week, or is this the sputtering starts of something bigger? A movement. And are you and I part of it? And how? How would we know if we are about bending a moment into a movement? I've mentioned reading this book, A Distant Mirror, about the 14th century, and about 400 pages in, I'm now at 1381, when a group of peasants in England, a group of stonemasons, of blacksmiths, of farmers, who have been pushed with their back to the wall, who have been laid upon with taxes and with the bubonic plague and the crippling abuses of the churches have finally said, this is enough, I'm not going to take it anymore. And they stand up and they pick up the tools of their trade. Pitchforks, axes, the tools that they work with on their hands and they rise up and say, enough of this. The Peasants' Revolt, that's what it's called of 1381, so up, an uprising so threatening that King Richard III, the second, goes out to meet them. A moment or a movement? Today, we start a new series, and it's not the series we thought we would be starting at the beginning of the year, and it's not even the series that we rewrote to start as late as two weeks ago. 
A new series, a different series, responding to what's happening right now called Powers and Principalities. And the name is taken directly from our text this morning, Ephesians chapter 6, Archai and Escusius in the Greek. A timely, relevant series because the images filling our news feeds are showing us expressions of powers. Both the powers of rulers and authorities and forces in high places and also the power of people. People with their backs to the walls rising up. We are watching both the concrete expressions of power, government buildings, squad cars, riot gear, weapons, and we're watching the body of the protest marchers, also an expression of power, physical manifestations of power. We're also seeing something else, and this is what I want to try and unpack with us today. We're also seeing spiritual expressions of power, a spiritual dimension to these powers and principalities. Because the powers around us emerge and grow out of both those external systems, that material concrete stuff, but also something internal. It's this felt spiritual energy. It is this collective ethos. It is an intrinsic spirituality that is just as real and just as vivid as the bricks and mortar. And it's a spirituality of the powers that are going to last a lot longer. In whatever form it may assume for a moment, it is a spirituality that keeps on shape-shifting. And right now we're seeing a spirituality of racism, a spirituality of white supremacy. The spirit of racism has proven itself to be one of the dominant forces in our country, moving like a prowling lion across centuries and wars and situations. I've said it before, we've talked about it before, but in our own country it keeps being a shapeshifter from the 70, 1776 War of Independence and the false promises made to African Americans who would be willing to join our little nascent fight to the Emancipation Proclamation and the promises that came with that that was snapped back by the Reconstruction, to promises made in World War II, if you'll only fight for America, to the false promises of mortgages that were never extended to black GIs. The voting rights in 65 now being currently systematically dismantled. Every presumed step forward answered with a violent pushback. The spirit power of racism simply withdrawing and re-emerging at another time in whatever physical form felt most effective for that time at hand. Our text today in Ephesians 6 beginning at verse 11 and 12. Most commentators think that this inner spirituality, this collective ethos of evils, is what Paul is naming in our passage. It is a heaping up of nouns. Paul throws in everything but the kitchen sink to describe this ineffable, invisible, world-enveloping reach of a spiritual network of powers that are at its heart hostile to life. Powers that threaten the very fabric and the fiber of human flourishing. This is all the archai and the excuses, the, the powers and the principalities you and I have ever encountered. Not only divine, but human. Not only personified, but structural. Not only presidents and kings, but atmosphere and power invested in institutions and in laws and in traditions and in rituals. This is a cumulative total effect of all of these taken together that has created a sense of bondage, a dominion of darkness, as Paul would describe evil in Colossians 1.13. Paul is talking about the power of an empire, the spirit of an empire, which can perpetuate itself through a succession of rulers so powerful as in the case of Rome that, that the spirit of that can even sustain the utter madness of three emperors in, run, in one century. 
This is a form of institutional idolatry, whereby religion and commerce and education and state make their own self-survival their highest goal. We've seen what Paul is talking about. We've seen that desire for self-preservation that this inner ethos can, can form into. Churches demanding that they open up for worship in a backdrop of a highly contagious deadly virus, knowingly, deliberately, perhaps endangering their own people. That's the kind of spirituality that Paul is talking about here. He's talking about the whole network of it. So formidable a foe, Paul says, demands spiritual weaponry. For it's clear that we're not just contending with human beings, blood and flesh, or insert any other name in there, because there are many individuals that come to mind we're not contending just with them. We're contending against the legitimations of them, the seats of power, the hierarchical systems, the ideological justifications, the putative sanctions. Paul knows that human figureheads are just there for a moment, a term of office. <laughs> but the ethos, the spirituality, transcends those incumbents in both time and power. It is this that Ephesians 6 is going against. It is the supra-human dimension of power in institutions and in the cosmos which must be fought, not any mere human agent. Oh, listen, this is what we're fighting, Paul says. A shape-shifting force of evil. And against such a foe, we have to take up the very weapons of God himself. And what would those weapons be? Armaments that are both offensive and defensive. Shields, breastplates, helmets to protect you against blows, yes but also offensive armor. The Roman legionnaire would use seven-foot javelins at the beginning of a battle, but those were too heavy to run with. So when the battle got close, they would put out their daggers, the macheras. That's the word that Paul is using there for the sword of the spirit. It's a dagger. It's a machera. Think about how that changes, huh? This, this passage. This is not from afar. This is close. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, Paul is talking about. This is Paul urging the church, bring the fight to the enemy. Bring it in close. Stirring. But still, these are strange, aren't they? These are strange weapons. Because even while he uses the language of the Roman legionnaire, look at how he reinterprets them. Faith, the gospel of peace, the word of God, truth, salvation, righteousness. But what good is truth unless it's the way the powers are ultimately unmasked? The truth is earlier Christians knew that in the time of Rome that the demons could wear togas. <laughs> or in our own moment, the truth about the value of black and brown bodies. The truth that without justice there is never going to be peace. The truth that justice is not simply activism to discard at a whim. It is love in action. It's to be the very fiber and frame of our life, the truth that God is always and forever aligned on the side of the oppressed. And what use is righteousness unless you really know all the way through you that righteousness reveals God's true will for the world? And what can the shield of faith do? Unless by it we have learned to discern 
just where those flaming darts are aimed at us. Unless we're able to use that shield um, to allow us to see that those flaming darts that tell us we are nothing can be discarded. Unless those flaming darts that say this will never have any traction to it are, are, are waved away by our shield of faith. Unless we understand the flaming darts that appeal to our ego and not to the goodness of God in us. Unless we understand that the flaming darts are asking us to worship the golden calf in our midst. What good in the face of such monolithic evil is a sword made of words? Unless evil itself is born of words and capable of being destroyed by the word of God. And as one friend reminded me this week, it was the sword that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King carried into Selma, into jail, into Washington, into Memphis. And why pray? Why pray? Look at that in verses 18 to 20. Paul pressing, pressing, pressing. Pray in the Spirit at all times. Pray for me that I know how to speak. Pray that I will be bold. Why press so deeply into prayer unless the only way the battle is fought is through the bracing, empowering breath of the Spirit of God moving in us and through us? Unless the only way we win this fight against evil is through a continual, ongoing, regular exposure to Jesus, to his love, to his life, to his teaching, to his forgiveness, to his hope, to his sacrifice, to his victory, to his resurrection. Why press so deeply in prayer? And let us see, unless it's the ongoing work of looking into the mirror of Christ's love and realizing the depth of our sin and our need for forgiveness. Ah, well, there it is. We press into prayer because we realize the reality that there is little that separates those who we critique from ourselves except that in God's grace we are welcoming the ongoing work of Jesus in our lives. Sisters and brothers, we risk being just another tool of the systems of evil if we don't realize we're fighting something bigger. We risk being just as co-opted by a different figurehead and a different change of regime. We risk this moment of being, of just a moment, and nothing more unless the people of God, you and me, church after church, congregation after congregation, one by one by one, take up the weapons of God. One last thing, Paul expected the church to win because he knew God was going to win. The peasants who revolted in 1831, or 1381 rather, lost their heads. But reform came, and history records that moment of farmers and masons and blacksmiths as being the first catalyst by which that movement was born. In the same century, John Wycliffe, scholastic priest working in England, he was one of the first voices to criticize the abuses of the church. He recovered the language of the gospel by translating the dagger of the spirit into the language of ordinary people. It was so threatening it so angered the powers and principalities that they had his body dug up and burned. But Wycliffe's moment was the beginning of the movement of the Reformation. A, moment, a movement that was going to send the Holy Spirit like a second Pentecost around the world. Mm. When you know God is going to win, 
You can see your moments and, and the little setbacks of, of your point in time, your setbacks, your losses. You see them in a different light, don't you? You recognize that this second in, that you stand in is part of a larger and broader story. And not only that, when you know that there's a greater power at work, then you're not carrying all this on your back. You're not counting on your own individual efforts to carry it across the finish line, no. However grand our work may seem at the time, this, this little day today, we don't carry this on our backs. <laughs> Jesus does. Jesus carries every single one, now and forever. It's Jesus is carrying you and me and the powers and principalities. The victory of the world is on his back. Church of God, the moment is now. We are in a battle with the principalities and powers of racism that have been a scourge to this country since we arrived on her shores. And you and I have unique places to be, unique work to do. On Monday morning, Pastor Randall and I talked about the absolute conviction to hold the power of prayer and the power of protest in the same hand. And on Tuesday evening, some of us went out to march and other, others of us knelt down on our knees. And on Wednesday morning, some moms had honest conversation with their kids about why it's so important that we proclaim Black Lives Matter right now. And other moms packed the groceries that were going to homebound seniors. And another LaSalle had a frank conversation on race for the first time ever with his golf buddy. Wednesday night, while some were distributing more than 170 meals to the swelling numbers of Breaking Bread guests, the Elder Board prayerfully met and outlined some next steps for our church. And a few financial folks raised the question, is now the time when we can give even more money away to those who need it? And on Thursday morning, others of us got up early to meet for prayer, to reflect on the words of Howard Thurman, while still others prepared for their day as lawyers and store clerks and social workers and educated. This is the battle, people. This is what it looks like to move from a moment to a movement. So gird up your loins. Put on your armor, pick up your dagger, <laughs> and take the battle to the enemy. God will win. Amen. God's name 
together glorify the Lord with me come exalt God's name forever oh taste and see that the Lord is good Oh, blessed are we who hide in Him. Oh, fear the Lord, all of you saints. He'll give you everything. He'll give you everything. So magnify. Exalt God's name together, glorify the Lord through me. Come exalt God's name. celebrating communion outside the home of Ida B. Wells, born in uh, 1862. Ida B. Wells was a woman whose placard right here says um, she refused to believe that a country so powerful to defend its citizens abroad could not defend its citizens here at home. That's very pertinent, isn't it? She was a woman equipped with the full armor of God who doggedly took all that armor directly into the belly of power. From the earliest of her in her career up until her dying day, she doggedly, sadly, chronicalized the listing of lynchings that were happening across this country. She was a woman, fully equipped in God's armor, fully possessed of what her mission was to do. People of God, as we stand before this home and we anticipate the power of this table, we're reminded 
of what happens at this table and the transformation that takes place whenever we practice the discipline of this table. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same manner, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and drink, for this is my blood, which has been shed for you. As often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do so in remembrance of me. Please join me in prayer. And this prayer will be shared by the two of us. Gracious and merciful God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for stopping by our hearts. We thank you, God, for the movement that we find ourselves in the midst of, even right now. And before we go any further, Lord God, we're reminded of your word that says, if we have aught against anything, that we should go to our brother and sister and ask forgiveness so that our prayers would not be hindered. And the only aught, Lord God, that we have this morning is a prayer on behalf of those that look like me. And that prayer is a prayer of repentance and an ask of forgiveness. Forgive us, Lord, for every time that we've thought and or believed that we were inferior to anyone but you. But there are other oughts, and there's the ought the people who look like me, and on behalf of people who look like me, we confess the savagery, the pride, the utter bankruptcy that we have ever thought ourselves to be over, above, supreme in any way to any of our brothers and sisters. We confess the sin, the desire, for white supremacy. We confess the sin of our racism. We confess the sin of our pride, our arrogance, our fear. For we have sinned against you, Father, and we have sinned against our brothers and sisters. And we seek your forgiveness right now. God, if we confess our sins to you, we know that you hear us and you deliver us, not by power nor by might, but by your spirit, says the Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for the power of your word, even right now, that, that we're reminded of from Psalms 133, that says, oh, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. For it is like the oil that ran down the head and even the beard of Aaron. And it is in that place, God, that you command the blessing. God, command the blessing upon this table right now, command the blessing upon those listening under the sound of our voice, and command the blessing upon the movement that this country finds itself in. And we'll be quick to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. We ask these prayers in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. People of God, these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Come to the table. Pastor Laura, the body of Christ broken for you and his blood shed for you. Pastor Randall, the body of Christ is broken for you and his blood is shed for you. Amen. Yes, 
Sisters and brothers, my prayer for you is what Paul prayed for his church in Ephesus. That you would put on the full armor of God. That you would pray in the spirit, that you would take up the helmet of salvation, the dagger of the spirit, and speak boldly. Grace and peace to you, now and forever. Go in peace.